So, welcome everybody uh, to this meeting of Bath Royal and the Science and Medicine uh, meeting. And I'm delighted this evening to welcome uh, Richard Spicer, who is uh, a retired paediatric surgeon who's going to be uh, talking to us about uh, esophageal atresia. Um, but a bit more about that from him in a moment. So Richard was born in Kent, one of three children. He trained in medicine at Guy's uh, and uh, trained in paediatric uh, surgery in Leeds, uh, so, sorry, Southampton, uh, and went to, to work as a consultant in Leeds. But on the way, he has also worked in Cape Town and helped establish uh, paediatric surgery in Oman. And when he started out in paediatric surgery, uh, it was a very different specialty from what it is now. He was a master of all trades, but he was forced to spe subspecialize. And uh, uh, over the years, it's become a more and more subspecialized uh, area. And so he um, has been uh, had a particular interest in neonatal surgery and in oncology. Um, when he's uh, not thinking about surgery, which he does obviously less nowadays. He enjoys sailing, swimming, being by the sea, being uh, anywhere but Bristol, which is where he works most of his life, I think. Uh, and he also has a, a degree in, li in literature that he's taken after retirement um, and uh, has done some writing, which he's very coy about, but I <laughs> that's to tell us a bit more about that. But maybe mostly the talk is going to be about esophageal atresia, uh, which is a condition close to his heart, even closer to the baby's heart he's treated. So let's, uh, no more ado, we'll hear about that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, and uh, thank you to those who um, introduced me to this distinguished institution and for inviting me to talk. Well, first of all, what is esophageal atresia? And I know uh, there are medical people in the audience, but this is designed for a non-medical audience. And um, it's not advancing. You're not. Okay. Uh, yeah. So um, the esophagus is the tube which we swallow down and takes our food down to our stomach. It's not a simple tube. And I remember in my time as a medical student, some of my uh, fellow students could actually demonstrate that they could drink a pint of beer standing on their head because of the ability of the esophagus to propel food and drink uh, onwards. And um, I couldn't actually achieve this, but I've, I've witnessed people doing it. So why did I decide to talk about this particular condition, which is one of a number of neonatal congenital abnormalities, which I have treated over my life's work? Um, you could argue that, you know, it's quite rare, so why is it important in terms of children dying around the world, malaria is much more important, half a million deaths a year from malaria. In terms of surgical operations, uh, you could argue that cataract surgery is a much more important um, operation. There are half a million done in the UK at the moment, and it's predicted that um, in another 10 years, it, because of the aging population, it could be a million a year. And Cataract surgery has a complication rate of less than 1%. Uh, it's a lot higher in uh, esophageal atresia. Anyway, the reason I wanted to talk about it is because, though it may not be important in world terms, it's important to the child that has it and the child's parents. And I have a personal interest in it, and I've would have woven that into a story, which is a story of persistent individuals working for the benefit of these babies. Sophogeal atresia was first described in the 17th century, 
uh, and basically the esophagus is not joined up as it should be. So it ends blindly at its upper end, and at the lower end, the lower esophagus joins onto the airway to the trachea uh, at the point where it's just about to branch into the two lungs. And 85% of cases are of this anatomy. So esophageal atresia and tracheoesophageal fistula. Fistula is an abnormal connection between two organs which are not meant to be joined. So that is the tracheoesophageal fistula there. The second commonest type is esophageal atresia without fistula. And the importance of that is that in these cases, the gap is much longer and it's often difficult to do the primary repair, which is the goal of surgery, to detach the fistula and to join the two ends. In this case of long gap, that's uh, not always possible and other things have to be done. I'll mention that later. How do you know a baby's got the condition? Well, they can't swallow, so they can't swallow their saliva and they have a lot of abnormal mucus accumulating around their mouth and nose. And it should be diagnosed at this stage before the baby's ever given a fee feed. If you feed them, the milk goes into their lungs and they um, uh, develop pneumonia, uh, which is one of the reasons these babies die. Obviously, they also die because they can't feed. So what's the approach? Well, for a long time, there wasn't an approach, really. This is the anatomy as seen in the neck. And there's an awful lot of what in surgical terms we would call clockwork here, hiding the esophagus. Um, there's major arteries, major veins, and important nerves, and then the esophagus just hiding behind there. So attempts to operate through the neck are fraught with difficulty. And um, in surgical parlance, this is what's called tiger country. Uh, it's also tiger country if you approach it through the chest. Um, here's um, the aorta, uh, very large veins going to and from the lungs and the esophagus tucked away behind this. So currently, what we do is to um, operate through the right side of the baby's chest uh, to spread between the ribs, detach the fistula and join the two ends, which is all very easy in principle. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you close the um, fistula where it joined onto the airway. Now, I'm going to take you briefly to, uh, to Bristol the reason for that is that um, that was where the first attempted operation uh, on esophageal atresia was done. Um, the original Children's Hospital was uh, founded um, in 1857, and then it moved to this purpose-built uh, building in Bristol, uh, which opened in uh, 1885. Um, at that time, it was called the Bristol Hospital for Women and Children. During World War II, the Luftwaffe bombed the hospital and a large part of its accommodation was unusable and so the women weren't admitted and it was only a children's hospital. And after the um, World War II, it was renamed uh, the Bristol Royal Hospital for Children. And that, this is a more up-to-date picture of this institution that I uh, worked in. There was a surgeon appointed to the Children's Hospital when it first opened called Charles Steele. And he was presented with a baby uh, with esophageal atresia. And it was known that all these babies died um, but he thought he would see if anything could be done. And he, if you read his description in The Lancet in 1888, he went to great lengths to give get informed consent from the parents to explain to them the child would die 
but that he wanted to see if he could do something to um, uh, save the child. And um, this degree of informed consent wasn't actually standard in those days, but it is an important feature of uh, modern practice that um, informed consent should always be taken. Uh, he operated under chloroform anesthesia. Um, I haven't got a photograph of Charles Steele, unfortunately, um, but uh, it's rather nice to read his obituary where they say, he took a great interest in his patients to whom he became much attached not only by his skill, but also by his geniality and good humour. Sounds like a good doctor to me, and it's a shame I haven't got a picture of him. So he operated under chloroform. He hoped that there would be a membrane that he could perforate. So he passed a, um, a rod. Sorry. He passed a rod. He opened the stomach, passed a rod up to see if his supposition was that there might be a membrane that he could perforate, but it he encountered a blind end at an inch and a half and uh, had to tell the parents that nothing could be done. So he had opened the stomach, uh, a gastrotomy, and I'll say more about that in a minute. Here is uh, the record, a contemporary sketch done in 1901, of a baby who was taken to Great Ormond Street with esophageal atresia. And this is this rather nice sketch that was done showing the blind end there, the fistula there joining onto the airway. And they opened the stomach. And what several people did at that time was to try to feed the baby uh, through the stomach. But of course, all that happened then is that the feed goes up the fistula into the airway and the baby dies of pneumonia, and this uh, particular baby uh, died at the age of three days. So there is a well-established operation done, not uncommonly still, called gastrostomy, where uh, a tube is introduced through the abdominal wall into the stomach, and patients can be fed through this long term, whilst they're made fit for treating whatever condition is stopping them feeding. A slight digression now. Um, this is Guy's Hospital in London, where I trained. And the reason I'm showing it is that this was uh, the first ever recorded operation of gastrostomy it was done in 1726 by John Cooper Forster. Um, sorry, the hospital opened in 1726. John Cooper Forster did the first gastrostomy on an adult in 1858, and a year later on a child. Um, this has nothing to do with esophageal atresia. The gastrostomy was done on an adult with um, esophageal cancer, and the child um, had swallowed caustic soda, and uh, that was why the gastrostomy was done in that particular case because the caustic soda had damaged the esophagus uh, so that it narrowed right down. Um, another, yet another digression, I'm afraid, excuse these digressions, but this rather elegant statue um, and its surrounding elegant Georgian buildings where I was for six years, um, you couldn't see this statue for two years. It was covered up in unsightly cardboard cladding, uh, plywood kept cladding, because two years ago, when Colston's statue was toppled into the harbour in Bristol, um, some students at King's College Hospital looked on Wikipedia and decided that Thomas Guy was a slave trader and the hospital authorities and university authorities immediately were frightened not to do something, and they covered it up with a, a plywood cover for two years. Uh, I and a number of other guys, alumni, campaigned on the position that he was not a slave trader, he was a philanthropist, 
And eventually, I'm glad to say that uh, just a couple of months ago, the cladding was taken off, and you can now go and see this lovely statue in its proper surroundings. Uh, now, I'm staying with Guy's Hospital because this is the man who encouraged me to become a surgeon. Uh, he, um, I worked under him as a student and then subsequently became a junior doctor under him and I determined to become a, a, a surgeon because of seeing him and how he worked and the things he did. He was a, a very general and very uh, skillful surgeon. He operated on quite a lot of children, but he didn't operate on esophageal atresia. He realized that it required specialist uh, surroundings to do so. So I first heard of esophageal atresia um, in the 60s when I was a, uh, a medical student. And um, he encouraged me in my wish to be a pediatric surgeon. So what was happening uh, during the years since Charles Steele's first attempt? All around the world, principally in America, a lot of surgeons were making attempts to operate by the neck, the abdomen, the chest. And in um, the 1930s, there were a few survivors. Now, these, of course, were survivors who could be fed by gastrostomy because they had no fistula, but they still couldn't swallow and... Uh, uh, it was uh, not really a satisfactory answer until this man came along. This is Cameron Haight, who performed the first total correction in a newborn baby in 1941. Uh, Haight was born in San Francisco, uh, trained at Harvard. Uh, he was an adult surgeon. There were no pediatric surgeons at that time. And he worked in the University Hospital Ann Arbor in uh, Michigan. Now, the name of hate may ring some bells in that um, this, there's a street in San Francisco called Hate, and it joins another one called Ashbury. And Hate Ashbury. Uh, is um, something that became very important in the 1960s. Um, Haight Street was named after Cameron Haight's grandfather, who was a businessman in San Francisco. This is one of the most stolen street signs in the world. You can see it's got padlocks here because they fed up with having to keep replacing it. The reason for that? Haight Ashbury was the epicenter of the Summer of Love in 1967. And um, some of you, I certainly remember it, but um, some of you may. So Cameron Haight, he had operated on 10 babies that had died before he had his first success. If you read the description of his first attempt, he um, was very reluctant to have another baby die on him. He couldn't face it. But his team persuaded him to have another go. And in this particular case, the child died. Before that, a lot of these babies died because um, of uh, hemorrhage from all those major blood vessels that I'd shown you while people tried to work out the anatomy. So in 1941, he had his first success. 1943, he presented a few cases to a surgical meeting in the States. And uh, in 1944, uh, he published a paper which achieved worldwide recognition that this condition could be treated. Um, Cameron Haight thereby had patients from all over the United States sent to him. And by the time he retired in 1970, he'd operated on more than 300 of these babies. The second country to achieve a success in um, esophageal atresia after the States was this man, Dick Franklin in London. Um, I did briefly meet 
uh, Dick Franklin because he was one of the examiners when I took my fellowship of the Royal College of Surgeons exam and his signature is on the certificate that's on my wall at home um, for uh, confirming my uh, fellowship of the uh, College of Surgeons. And he, um, he operated on a colleague of mine when that colleague was a student. So it's fairly recent history. Uh, but anyway, he um, achieved the first successful repair outside the United States. And that was in 1947. Um, and this is just a little look at the history there, 1941 in the States, 1947 in the UK, and later on in the Netherlands, they had their first success. And then these countries all gradually managed to get success. Um, there are two countries I've starred here. One is South Africa's, because I worked in Cape Town with the surgeon who did that first repair in 1956. Uh, sometimes difficult to get these figures. Um, I can. Some of them are personal communications. Some of them are published papers. Um, and I can vouch for this one because that first operation in Oman was done by me. Uh, before that, they used to send babies to Great Ormond Street, and not all of them survived the journey. So uh, this is the Dick Franklin's first uh, successful patient, Jenny Savory. Uh, she was born at Queen Charlotte's Hospital in London and transferred to the Hammersmith, where he operated on her. Um, he, Dick Franklin had had eight deaths over a nine-year period before his first success. So around the time that Cameron Haight was trying to achieve a survivor. Dick Franklin was doing the same. Um, you can see that this is a recent picture of this lady and she's well nourished and she's able to Im imbibe important nutrients. Um, I've looked at other countries and their experience with this condition. And uh, I pick out this chap, Henry Barrett. He worked in a small hospital in New Zealand, um, New Plymouth, and he uh, operated on a baby. He's the first person in that era that I've been able to discover who had a success with his first operation. Um, but the people in Auckland felt he shouldn't have done this, and they insisted that all esophageal atresia should be sent to Auckland. And over the next um, years, they operated on 45 cases in Auckland with a 50% mortality. By all accounts, Henry Barrett was a very skilled surgeon, and one wonders whether if he'd carried on doing them, he would have had better than 50% survival. So this is the survival curve. Um, showing how these babies all died in 1940, and most of them live now. Uh, I have a sort of personal interest in this because I, I was born there, and if I'd been born with this condition, I would not be here to be talking to you now. And this is a point I always um, pointed out to trainees and assistants when I was operating on this condition. Uh, so, I was born there. I first heard of this condition as a student there. I assisted at my first operation on esophageal atresia there in 1970. And I did my first case as first surgeon in 1980. And all this time, the um, survival rates are increasing. Now, this is 2000, and um, the survival curve has sort of flattened out here because the proportion of these babies are always going to die because of 
associated problems that they have, particularly cardiac problems and chromosomal defects. So I do, I do, any paper that claims 100% survival have not been honest or not got a big enough series. Um, sorry. So what are the um, reasons that we've achieved this success over the years? Pediatric surgery developed as a speciality in the 1950s and so did paediatric anaesthesia, and these were major factors. Neonatal, neonatal intensive care uh, made massive strides in the 1970s onwards, and throughout this period, antibiotics were coming in and techniques of intravenous fluids were coming in. At this stage, in the 1940s, um, giving fluids by any other route than the stomach was um, quite difficult. And uh, it was given by the subcutaneous route, which is extremely inefficient, really. Um, the surgical principles were established by Haight um, and the basis of surgery hasn't changed but uh, things were developing over this uh, period. Now, what was happening over this early years in uh, Bristol? Um, it's difficult to get all the figures. I'm sure a number of babies died, but they're not documented. Um, 24 babies were treated with old-fashioned operations in multiple stages by an adult surgeon working in Bristol. But I think he, he inevitably tried primary repair and they all died. So he went back to this old fashioned operation. What happened in 1976? Well, this lady arrived in Bristol. The first pediatric in surgeon in Bristol, um, Helen Noblet. Uh, she came from Melbourne in Australia. She'd already published two landmark publications, which are still widely quoted in the um, surgical literature. She was much respected on Australia and in the States, a bit neglected in the UK. Um, a surgeon in Glasgow has written a, a book on the history of paediatric surgery, and he doesn't even mention her, uh, which is a, a gross injustice to her, really. She had a reputation of being difficult, I uh, have to say, I think she just had very, very high standards. She was always very kind and helpful to me. But um, if anything was not being done to a perfect standard with her patients, she had a very uh, direct way about her of making sure that things were corrected. So this is the... Um, current Melbourne Children's Hospital, where they had as results as where she trained and came from. Uh, they have results as good as anywhere in the world, really. Between 1948 and 1984, they treated 511 babies with uh, results better than anywhere else. Uh, we still have a system in uh, Bristol, where we exchange trainees. So we send a trainee to Melbourne for a year. They send us one in Bristol for a year. And that was a very useful collaboration. What about results in other countries? Well, um, it's difficult sometimes to get figures, but these are papers that I think can be believed. And these are genuine figures. So in developing countries, the mortality is quite high. And uh, it's interesting to read these papers to see how uh, they're struggling to achieve better results. Uh, this interesting paper a couple of years ago looked at the world situation. Um, they were looking at um, the paediatric surgical workforce uh, in terms of the 
uh, number of pediatric surgeons per child population. Um, they not surprisingly showed that there's a direct result between um, national income and surgical results. But what they pointed out was that developing countries have very, very few pediatric surgeons, um, but they have 80% of the worldwide deaths from non-communicable child diseases. Uh, no surprise here that um, national income mirrors uh, results. And relating this to the number of pediatric surgeons per million, countries with no pediatric surgeons have no survivors. Um, the optimum number is probably 95 per million children, and that's achieved in the UK, in France, in Australia. Poland is a bit of an outlier with more pediatric surgeons than that, but their results for esophageal atresia are not better than the results in these countries, and that's slightly worse. You'll notice the absence of the United States here. The reason for that is that if you look at the major centers in the United States, they have results as good as anywhere in the world. But uh, if you actually look at the few papers that look at the whole picture in the States, which of course has the worst health service in the developed world, uh, you'll see that there are a number of small centers. And if you look at those figures, they, there are more pediatric surgeons than there should be in the States and their results are not so good. So what's the future for this condition? In developed countries such as this, uh, you need to increase the experience of the surgeons operating on it. So in large centers, um, subspecialization is necessary. So not every pediatric surgeon in every center operates on esophageal atresia, maybe two or three in each center will specialize in it. And small centers who only get a very few cases, number of cases a year, uh, should send their patients to larger centers. Um, so this is the um, hospital where babies are referred from the Southwest now. And uh, what are results? The results here are as good as anywhere in the country and anywhere in the world. Um, the um, interesting thing is that um, when you're talking about subspecializing, um, there are attempts to, uh, in the Netherlands, it's quite interesting. Uh, the Dutch surgeons did try to say that all babies with esophageal atresia should be treated in one center because um, that would increase the um, experience of the surgeons in that center. And of course, you can drive across the Netherlands in only four hours, so it's perfectly feasible. In Australia, uh, it's all air transport and large distances. But uh, anyway, they haven't quite achieved that in the Netherlands uh, because of local medical politics. Uh, in Bristol, there are very good results. And in particular, uh, these are colleagues of mine uh, following my retirement who carried on this work for the very long gap um, atresia we have developed a technique using small intestine, the jejunum, uh, and the, the trick in doing it is to dissect the vascular anatomy so that this graft you're going to put between the two ends of the esophagus um, is uh, well supplied with blood supply. Uh, this, the fine details of this technique we learned from a Dutch surgeon, Klaus Bax in Utrecht, and he came over and uh, did cases with us. But uh, we now, uh, from Bristol, have um, 
what a big series of these cases who are doing very well. So can I reach a, a summary about anything? Um, the summary really is that surgery cannot function without an economy to fund it and politics to run it. And um, we're suffering some economic problems in this country at the moment, but we are one of the richest countries in the world, so we should be able to do things to a good standard. Politics a bit more of a problem because successive um, governments have not always done the right thing. Uh, it's not mentioned that I worked in Oman for a year and I went out there, there was no paediatric surgery. Within a year, there was a full, well-staffed department. This was because it's a benign dictatorship with a very efficient system of government. I was subsequently invited to go to Libya to try and uh, see if they could improve their results. But the political system is so chaotic there. This is obviously before the present situation there. It was the time of Gaddafi. And um, it was just not possible to change things in the way they needed. Um, and some of the bad results are simply due to things like um, late diagnosis and late referral. Uh, one of the things I did in Oman was to go around the country uh, to smaller centres giving lectures about how to make the early diagnosis and how to refer these babies and other uh, babies uh, in a prompt fashion. Um, I went to Russia with a group of other paediatric specialists around in the early 90s. And there's a condition called um, gastroschisis for which we have a 90% success rate and they had a 90% mortality, and they thought that uh, I was doing some different operation. It was nothing to do with that. It was to do with systems to diagnose these patients early and get them referred to a, a centre with expertise. So politics are important. So I uh, just uh, it remains to me to thank Richard very much for a fascinating talk. It is always... Uh, a particular pleasure to hear a combination of science, personal experience for someone who has actually seen a field evolve uh, in their lifetime. It gives a particular perspective. And I think uh, um, those people uh, may not realize this, but I think as a tribute to him personally, there's a number of his trainees here in the room who've come to listen to him talk from all around the country. So thank you very much. Well, uh, for the talk, which was uh, fascinating. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark.